Um, I'm going to introduce you. OK, great. But I'm ready. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 2024 San Diego Mycological Society Fungus Fair. Um, has everyone checked out the vendors and room 101 with the uh, specimens? Yes. yes. Did anyone get any of that candy cap ice cream? Sold out. Uh, <laughs> it's still, it was delicious. Um, so I hope you enjoyed today's events. We're nearing the end. Um, it was a lovely day of wonderful fungus. Uh, our next speaker is uh, my good friend, Alan, uh, coming from Oakland. Um, I've had the pleasure of foraying with you here in San Diego a few times in the last handful of years. Um, you haven't been back in a little bit, but we're glad to have you this year. Um, I saw him last year at NAMA, North American Mycological Association uh, annual foray, which was in North Carolina. And I did your um, nighttime. Oh yeah, that uh, was cool. Nighttime class, mm -hmm. yeah. Mushrooms glow in the dark. Cool. <laughs> um, yeah, without further ado, uh, let's give a warm welcome to Alan. Thank you very much. So I am going to talk about the mushrooms of Ecuador today, as you guys probably guessed. But before I start, I wanted to show you a little bit about how I do the photography. So uh, if I switch over to here, when I take pictures, I use a technique called image stacking. So I combine a whole bunch of pictures into one picture. And so here's what it looks like just as it comes off the camera. I get a whole bunch of very similar pictures. And what I do is drag that over into Helicon Focus. So this is Helicon. And you can see I got 86 pictures. And the reason there's so many is because the aperture is wide open. And when the aperture is wide open, then the background is really blurry. Uh, but combining all of these pictures, I get as infinite depth of field, like as much as I want. So I can just hit go on this. And you can actually watch the image come together here. And it probably take a minute or two. Um, but, yep, there it starts to go. And so you get like a bunch of them in the front. And that's just like that leaf in the front. So I start the image stack by focusing. So the whole image is blurry because it's focused too close. And then it starts taking pictures and it takes a picture. And then it changes the focus a little bit. Takes another picture, change, takes, changes the focus. So in this one, I got 86 of these. And now you can see the mushroom is starting to come into focus here. And so it just takes the sharp parts of each image and combines them. And that way the background is still really blurry. So the mushroom really stands out from the background. And I don't have to like close down the aperture. So I get really good resolution. Um, so it kind of like breaks the laws of physics. And in that way, I um, can get the pictures to look really good. And so that's how I take all my pictures now. If I'm not going to image stack them, I just use my cell phone. Um, and yeah, 86 is a bunch of them. And these, um, these are taken with a Nikon, probably a Z9. So these are 45 megapixel pictures. So they're like really high resolution pictures. Um, and the cool thing about that is that this camera has really good dynamic range and also really good resolution. And I always use a 50 millimeter macro lens. Um, so like the detail on these pictures are really good. And this thing got totally messed up. I think what happened is that I combined way more than I should have. So I combined two image stacks, uh, but <laughs> it should be really crisp. And uh, you can see there's a ton of detail here. And this just looks really trippy so <laughs> yeah so i should probably save this and like sell posters or something um, but what i should have really done is instead of combining 86 pictures it probably should have been 43 that's probably two stacks that i put together there anyway all of the pictures are done like that um what's that called uh which one the, the program the procedure you 
The procedure is called photo stacking. And the, more, the smaller the mushroom is, the more important it is to photo stack. So a really big mushroom, you don't really need it. Or if you do, you only stack two or three. Whereas really tiny mushrooms, I'll combine like a hundred of them. Um, so th where I went was the Ecuadorian Amazon. So it's kind of like the middle of the country, but a little bit east. And um, this is what the Amazon looks like. And um, so this is in the state of Pastaza. And Pastaza is the largest state of Ecuador and is the least populated. So there is very, very, very few people in Pastaza. And most of the places you have to take a boat to get there because there's only a couple roads. But my friend Furhat, um, if you guys post mushrooms on Facebook, you probably know Furhat because he's an amazing mushroom identifier and he's in every Facebook group. But Furhat owns an eco resort in Pastaza. And so you can see just coming over the hill, this is his eco resort. And so um, really cool place. It's like um, kind of like a high end hotel in the middle of the Amazon. And so that's where we stayed. And um, he's got, uh, if you look out here, yeah, he's got like miles and miles of trails down there. And so the trails are just full of all sorts of wildlife and mushrooms. And so Ecuador is uh, up here, just south of Colombia and just north of Peru. And then in Ecuador, this is where I go. So um, you can see this is Pastaza here. And I've been to like just this edge of Pastaza because that's where the only roads are. The rest of Pastaza has no road at all. So it's very similar to the Brazilian Amazon um, because um, this is part of the Amazon basin, but it's pretty different to where I went in Brazil three months ago um, because that was like the Atlantic forest side. And so, yeah, it's, it's very similar to the Brazilian Amazon. So we do take boats some places and there are re there's really cool wildlife there. So this is one of those frogs um, and for st stuff like this, I, ju I don't photo stack it. I just close the aperture and use a lot of flash. That way it like, captures the motion. Uh, you can only photo stack things that are very still. And we find lots and lots of cool things. This one here is a Deconica, and it looks very similar to Psilocybe. So it looks very similar to a magic mushroom. But this one, um, I was able to tell that it's not a magic mushroom because it doesn't stain blue and also by the flavor. So whenever I find something like this, I taste a little bit. Um, I taste really every plant and mushroom that I find. And these tasted like the Konica. There's no English word for the taste, but I can just tell that it's not one of the psilocybin mushrooms. It's completely safe to taste all of the mushrooms you find as long as you spit them out. It is not safe to taste all of the plants you find, but I do it anyway. <laughs> so you can see um, this one definitely photo stacked because the background is so blurry, but you get like, you know, lo lots of detail in the stems here. So these have purple spores, just like the salasabi and um, very cool little Deconica species. And Deconica are very mysterious. You have a bunch of them here in San Diego. And then there's really crazy insects as well. This one is called a peanut head, um, or the scientific name, Fulgoria lanternea. But it's about three inches long, and it flies, and it is just it was super, super adorable. <laughs> and then there's also a lot of very rare plants there. So the place that we're going, it's part of this biodiversity corridor that has some of the best biodiversity of anywhere in the world. And so this is a heliconia, and this heliconia is very rare. There was only a couple observations on iNaturalist in the whole world, and they're all only in the spot. So this heliconia is endemic to this little part of Ecuador. And then this is a hygrosibi, and there's a lot of hygrosibis there, and the colors on these hygrosibis can be really good. There's a lot of purple ones and red ones, but my favorite are the green ones. So it's a very tiny little mushroom. You can see with this photo, I used flash, so it lit up the gills really good. And it doesn't, the lighting does not look anywhere near natural, but it does look cool anyway. Um, more often, I just use natural light. And when you do that, the gills are kind of like in a shadow. 
um, or even more often I'll mix natural light with LED light. So it's like 90% natural light and like 10% LED light. No, uh, well that one was, um, was just regular light from a flash, but I do have some photos in, in the presentation where I used ultraviolet lights. This thing is really cool. This is a Luco Caprinus. And there were thousands of these kind of like in and around this big tree, sp tree stump. And the cool thing about these leucocoprinus is that they have these little droplets of metabolites all over them. And so if you look close enough, you know, they act as a lens and you can kind of like see the forest behind. Um, but really cool, very fragile white spored mushroom. And I tasted these droplets and they have absolutely no flavor. <laughs> and it's certainly possible that they're poisonous. But um, just one drop of like mushroom poisons is, is not enough to do anything to you. When you say metabolite, are, can you explain that just a little bit more? Yeah, so a lot of mushrooms make metabolites that they don't want. And one way they can get rid of them is by having these droplets and then they kind of like excrete the, the molecules that they don't need into these droplets. So uh, a bunch of different mushrooms do this. Sometimes they're different colors, like they can be red or they can be clear. Um, and it's just like chemicals the mushrooms are trying to get rid of. Are those chemicals ever useful for other organisms? I wish I knew. And, you know, some of them are probably kind of poisonous. Um, you know, there's, mushrooms make thousands of really crazy chemicals. And uh, some of them will be medicinal and some of them do nothing at all. Um, you know, this one, just because it had no flavor, I don't get the feeling that it had a whole lot of effect, but you never really know. What would be really cool is to run all of these through like an LCMS, so liquid chromatography mass spec, you can use to figure out what all these chemicals are. Um, and that's what I'd like to do in the future, is just like collect mushrooms and run them all through LCMS and NMR to figure out if any of the molecules are valuable, and if so, then like culture them in a big bioreactor. Um, this is cool because this is a little marasmius, and you can see it's definitely photostacked, but also I took the picture in two different ways. This is with natural light, so just whatever light came down through the forest canopy. And then here I flooded it with LED light. So I like both of them. Um, you know, they're kind of a different feeling with this and this one. Um, you can definitely like see better details <laughs> in this one here. Um, but it's really nice to take the, the same picture with like several different kinds of lighting and just see which one you like best. And you can even like load them all into layers in Photoshop and then combine them so you can like have like a little bit of each. Uh, one really cool thing about this one is that it had these black fibers. So you zoom way in. Yeah, and I'd never seen this before, the black fibers in a cap of a Rumorasmius. And so I posted these on all the Facebook groups where all the experts hang out the other day. There was like a Angos de Ecuador Facebook group, which is the, the mushrooms of Ecuador. And there's a lot of very smart people on there, but nobody knew which one this was. There's a lot of new species there. This one here is a Mycena. And there's a lot of Mycenas in Ecuador and they get really cool colors um, and kind of cool textures as well. So I definitely like photographing all the Mycenas. Here's another one. This one is Mycena chlorozantha. And Mycena chlorozantha is super fragile. And you can see like the stem texture here. It has, um, these are called setae on the stem. So it's these little cells that uh, kind of come off like bristles. And they look really cool in the microscope. And then this yellow powder, this, this is called acanthocytes. And so they're just covered in this yellow powder. Um, also look very cool in the microscope. But yeah, these cl my little mycenas are some of my favorite to photograph. Alan? Yep. How far away are you from most of these <laughs> when you're taking the picture? So in this case, about, I'd say the lens was probably eight inches to a foot away. Um, so the lens I use is a 50 millimeter macro lens. So I don't have to be super far away. The lens that I'm carrying right now is a 90 millimeter macro lens with a tiny sensor. So I have to be like three or four times farther away from the mushroom. But, you know, the thing that a macro lens lets you do is focus very close. So I can put the lens like right up to the mushroom and get insane amounts of detail. But it doesn't have to focus close. You know, you can back way off and even take pictures of like distant mountains and stuff like that. So that's why I like macro lenses because they're really versatile and you can get really good detail. Um, also, I forgot to mention that if you have any questions, just, just shout them out. 
Uh, I will take questions at the end if we have time, but it's really better if you ask questions right when you're thinking about them. Um, but it's a little dark. I probably won't see you if you raise your hand, so the best thing to do is just start talking over me. <laughs> <laughs> this thing is cool. This is a Mycena in the Mycena Pura group. And one thing I like about these is the anastomosing gills. So the gills are kind of like, you know, cross vein. And um, these also have bioluminescent mycelium. So the mycelium is glowing in the dark. Um, and I have some photos of that later on. Alan, do you know, is there a purpose for glowing mushrooms? Um, nobody really knows, but maybe it attracts insects. What is the purpose of anastomosing gills? Like more oh, surface? that's a really good question. And I have no idea why they have the anastomizing gills. Um, you know, it's probably not just to delight macro photographers, but it, <laughs> they certainly do that. Um, here's another Mycena. And this one's cool because the stem was just like really slimy. So it has these awesome like kind of like undulating slime things. And then mush the gills kind of run down the stem. Um, and you can see this is just growing off of a leaf. So the Mycenas are some of the major decomposers of leaf litter. This one is called Mycena spinosima, and that's a species described from Chile. Uh, but it has these little spines on here, and they come off really easily. In fact, when I found this mushroom, it had the spines totally covering it, and then I bumped it, and I was really sad, but I took the picture anyway because it's still cool. Uh, and also this really good sete uh, on the stem as well. Is the sete the same as calocystidia? Yeah, you could call it calocystidia. Calocystidia is usually smaller, and then if it gets like really long, like almost like bristles or hairs, then they're called sete. But basically synonyms. And then there's a ton of mushrooms that eat bugs in Ecuador. So this is one of them. And um, yeah, so there's a, several different genera. Cordyceps is one genus. Um, this one I don't think is in cordyceps. Um, if I search on iNaturalist or Mushroom Observer, I could probably figure out what it was because when I find something like this, what I do is I get the picture together and then I tag like Jao Arujo or Richard Tejan. Those are both cordyceps identification experts. And those guys are so sharp and they're super cool. So they tell me what all the cordyceps are. And then I don't have to men uh, memorize thousands of cordyceps species. Um, do you taste that one too? No, I didn't taste this one, but it'd be safe to taste. Uh, but definitely on some kind of insect. And there's so many of these like, cool little lizards and things. So this is a gecko, and he thought he was really camouflaged. So this guy, <laughs> this guy was right in the middle of the trail, and was just completely still. So usually you can't photo stack things when they're moving, but since he was so still, I was actually able to photo stack this. And it's like a hundred pictures just going all the way down his back and tail. And so it yeah, ends up looking really cool. And he's got like an awesome stem texture, or <laughs> skin te texture and like dinosaur claws. Um, yeah, it's just a really cool thing. And there are so many of these things. Some of them were like really big, like iguana type things, like three, almost four feet long, just really colorful. The sky was like maybe eight inches long. And then the plant diversity there is amazing. And the reason the mushroom diversity is so good is because the plant diversity is so good. So like you know, around here in California, we probably have like maybe 15, 20 native trees in this area. Whereas um, in, in the Ecuadorian Amazon, you can have hundreds of species of native trees in the same acre. So there's just so many different plants. And because of that, there's just so many different species of fungi to go with all those different kinds of plants. Um, this particular one is called Banisteriopsis capi. So this is the ayahuasca vine. So this is the vine that the natives have been using for thousands of years. Um, and it uh, activates the DMT. And then here we have a Psychotrotica species. So this um, is the plant that has the DMT. So we found all of the ingredients for ayahuasca just growing all together um, in the forest. And we found that a few times that like, the, the ingredients for ayahuasca would grow together. Um, in this part of Ecuador, there's lots of native tribes that use the ayahuasca and have been using it for thousands of years. Uh, but the active ingredient ayahuasca, DMT, is only a couple molecules away from psilocin which is the uh, active ingredient in magic mushrooms. So it's very similar to a mushroom trip. Um, 
but um, yeah, the plant diversity there was really good. Oh, and I don't know much about plants, so what I do is just take a picture of all of the plants and put them on iNaturalist, and then all of the botanists like figure out what all the plants are. This is a native snail. Um, here we have Jordan Jacobs. But yeah. this snail is huge. <laughs> And there's some other ones that, were, that are like um, invasive from Africa, but this one's been in Ecuador forever, so we didn't eat it. Um, but really cool looking thing, there's the eyeballs. And just found it there in the ground. I think these are baby snails down here. Yeah. <laughs> and then here's a bioluminescent mushroom. So there's a couple different kinds of glowing mushrooms and Bioluminescent mushrooms are making light all the time. So they're glowing all day and all night and they make their own light. They're always this shade of green. And so uh, what we do to find these things is just turn off all of our lights and then walk through the jungle at night until we see like little patches of glowing stuff and then stop and take pictures of them. Um, at night is when the jungle really comes alive. Like you, you just stop in the jungle at night and you hear things in all sides of you. Insects, uh, animals of all different kinds, um, all the snakes come out at night. So it's really dangerous to walk around the woods at night, <laughs> but, but we do it anyway. Like I'll start at 8 p.m. and just walk it with no lights until 4 a.m. and wow. photograph these uh, bioluminescent mushrooms. We should do, we could take tours. Yeah, actually, I am, I am leading a foray there. And I'll tell you about that in a little bit. Is the soil in this jungle as poor as the Amazon soil? Yes. Is um, this is soil? part of the Amazon. It's just the Ecuadorian side. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, uh, it's very poor soil. But this jungle is in really good shape, so everything's in symbiosis. But, yeah, well, what they like to do is they like to cut down these, uh, these forests. And then the soil is only good for a couple of years, so they'll grow crops for a couple of years and then just abandon it. And like when we get there, we drive through a lot of areas like this, and they do not recover quickly at all mm. because of the, the poor soil. So they're basically just covered in these like little ferns, and they're just kind of like, Tiger yeah, and it's just, um, it's really sad. And so, yeah, the, the amount of species extinction happening here is uh, very high. And so one thing we're trying to do is document all of these species before they go extinct. And we're working with the, um, it's the National Institute for Biodiversity. So we're collecting everything we photograph and then drying it. And then um, it all goes to the herbarium in Quito and they save it forever. And then they also have a nanopore sequencer there. So we're going to be able to do DNA sequencing and figure out what all of these things that we're photographing are. Uh, but this is that glowing mushroom and I just like gave it some LED light so we could see it. Um, it's probably an undescribed species of Penelis, which is sister to Mycena. And the stems on these glow. So the cap's barely glowing at all, but it's most of the stems glowing. And this was growing on bamboo. This is another bioluminescent mushroom and this one's a Mycena. And so um, this is one of my favorite pictures because it turned out really good. And you can like zoom way in and see all of the detail. But this is, um, I think it was 30 images that I did photo stocking on and each frame was 30 seconds. So it ended up taking about 20 minutes to take this picture. And so what I did is I just set up the camera and um, started taking the pictures and then I just walked away from it and then just like went mushroom hunting for about half an hour and came back and it was done. So that's what it is in complete darkness. So it's just making its own light. And these are really bright too. Like if you pick one of these up and you throw it, you almost see trails in your vision just because they're very bright mushrooms. Um, and then here's what the actual mushroom looks like. So I just used uh, LED light and you can see it's kind of a cool mycena with these decurrent gills, um, kind of a funky gill pattern. Um, so very likely a new species of mycena. And then we, um, I always photograph the bugs there. I don't know anything about bugs, so I just put them on iNaturalist. And there's some really excellent bug experts. Um, one lady that we met at this place, uh, her name is Erica, and she's writing a book on the moths there. And so she identifies all my insects and moths, and she's really sharp with it. This is a katydid, and so it's pretending to be a leaf. Um, it has this massive long antenna. There's a lot of katydids. And then this one here is Psilocybe cerulescens. So Psilocybe cerulescens um, is a psilocybin mushroom, and you can tell it's cerulescens 
because it has this kind of flaccose mycelium on the bottom half, and then the top half is smooth. And they're very large mushrooms. Um, when, I, when I found these, we were with the, a native tribe called the Sachawasi. And these are some of the, uh, one of the tribes where people travel to Ecuador to take ayahuasca with the Sachawasi tribe. And so I pointed out the mushrooms and I asked them if, if they use these mushrooms and they say, yes, we eat them. And I said, oh, how do you eat them? And they said, oh, we, ro we roll them up in banana leaves and cook them in the fire and eat them for dinner. Um, I don't think they knew what they were though, because even if you cook psilocybin mushrooms, they're still very potent. Um, so I think um, they would have been in for a big surprise if they had eaten them. Um, but we took these and brought them back and taught them all how to identify these. Um, so they're, they're able to, because um, they, for their mushroom ceremonies, they had been purchasing psilocybin cubensis from in town. And now they know that they have a native um, psilocybin mushroom that grows. This is just like a couple hundred meters from the village. Here's a little campanella thing. So yeah, these things I like quite a bit. They're almost like sparkly with all the little basidia there. And we also went, and view, went to these caves. And uh, the caves are these limestone caves. And so this frog is a cave frog, so it doesn't occur anywhere outside of caves. Um, but very cute little frog, almost translucent. And then another thing that grows in the caves is this little cordyceps thing. And this one, it starts out white. And you can see it's kind of like all stringy and stuff. And then it turns yellow after a few days. And then it turns orange. Um, so that thing was really cool. Another thing that I see a lot is this penicillium. And so usually penicillium is just like mold on oranges, but this one actually, you know, this, so this here is a palm nut and it actually, you know, makes a pretty big structure. And you, we find these in the woods a lot too. This has happened to be a palm nut that rolled into the cave and so it fruited in the cave. But you can see it's got all these cool droplets here. And um, this is what it looks like in ultraviolet light. So you can see the droplets are, very, uh, very fluorescent. So there's some metabolites in these droplets that are converting ultraviolet light into visible light. And the close up of these. There was a lot of. Is the penicillium in itself making the structure or is it on something else? No, it's the penicillium itself making the structure. Uh, it kind of almost looks like a coral mushroom when it's out in the forest because they're like kind of sticking straight up. It was growing funny because it was in the cave. Um, but there was a certain kind of palm tree, and under that, there were, it was pretty common to find these things. And this is a slime mold. There's a lot of slime molds around. And this particular slime mold is like Ceratiomyxa, um, I think Ceratiomyxa poroides or something. But I like how it looks like it's made of glass. Uh, they're really tiny. Here's Ceratiomyxa fruticulosa, so another slime mold. These things are more closely related to amoebas than they are to fungi. And there are these uh, Claveria. Now this one we're calling Claveria schaeferi, but the real Claveria schaeferi was discovered in Germany. And so it's very unlikely to be Claveria schaeferi, but uh, that's what we call it. We just borrow this German name until it gets a, its own South American name. And then this is a Kukaina. Um, very cool thing, kind of looks like a toilet plunger. <laughs> and it's growing off of all decayed wood here. And then here's a cordyceps. This one is called Ophiocordyceps melolonthe. And so here it's growing off of a beetle, and this is a beetle from the genus Melanthona. So it's a really big beetle, and that makes for a really big cordyceps. This thing was like six inches tall. And so we see just the top sticking out. And if you zoom in on the top, you can see all these dots. Those are parathesia. So they make their spores in the parathesia, and then the spores just fly out. And so you see just the top sticking above the ground. And when we see that, we know to carefully dig down, and then we can find the insect host. Hey, Alex? Yep. Do we have any kind of, I mean, are there cordyceps species in San Diego County? I imagine there might be some. There are very few in California, and I don't know if they make it to San Diego County, but there's one that's going to be published soon. It's, called, it's going to be called Cordyceps Californica, and it's basically the West Coast version of Cordyceps Militaris. So Cordyceps Militaris is described from out east, and it's really common in like Pennsylvania and areas like that. 
And then there's just like four or five people that have found it in California. And it turned out that it had like a really different DNA sequence in California. Um, but it's super rare. I know it occurs in Southern California. I don't know if it makes it into San Diego County or not. Um, it's definitely on insects. I forget what kind of insect it is, but I'm thinking maybe Lepidoptera, so it'd be like little caterpillar things, but a lot of these are also growing on uh, Coleoptera, or like this one here is growing on a spider. Um, but a cool thing to do is just type in cordyceps, or to get a little bit broader, cordycepitaceae for the family, or and ophiocordycepitaceae, and just search California. Um, uh, if we have time at the end, I can do some searches in iNaturalist and we can see what we can pull up. Uh, but that's a really good way to keep track of that. And then all of those cordyceps experts like watch that stuff, so they've already weighed in on all of the observations, so you get a real good idea what they are. So this down here is a spider, and this is a trapdoor spider. So trapdoor spiders make a trapdoor that they open and close, and this is the trapdoor here. So this round thing. Um, you know, usually it's covering and then they just like open and just like reach these long legs out and grab the insect out of the air. And then the cordyceps um, just fruiting directly out of it. So this is Cordyceps nidus, um, a species described um, just a couple years ago from Colombia. And then this one is Ophiocordyceps cucurillianum. And the cool thing about this one is that it grows on weevils. So if you look at the weevil, you can see it has this massive snout. And so they stick that into the plants and then they get the, uh, you know, the, all of the juice from the plants and, you know, they live that way. But the way I found this, mu this mushroom was to flip over the leaves. So if you just walk along and whenever you find a leaf, you flip it over and look at the underside. That's how you find a lot of cordyceps. I went mushroom hunting with Jao Arujo, which is one of the world's expert in cordyceps. And that's all he was doing was just looking at the undersides of leaves. Like he would just kind of like walk under where there was just like, you know, you could just look up and see the leaves. He would just like walk under all the places and flip up every leaf. And so I thought of this and I, um, I thought of Zhao and I started flipping leaves. And like the third leaf I flipped over had this guy underneath. Oh and so I'm like, wow. And I got these pictures and then I flipped over thousands more leaves and didn't see any more. <laughs> But that's a technique that works anywhere in the world. Um, in California, you're more likely to see gibbalula than cordyceps, but it's the same, same kind of thing where gibbalula parasitizes spi spiders and it makes these cool stroma that make the spores. Um, and so um, a lot of times we'll like, flip over sword ferns and stuff and find gibbalulas under there. They're really little, so you have to kind of like look carefully. Um, but anywhere in the world, it definitely pays to flip over leaves. And then this is the nymph of, I think they said it was a, um, some kind of katydid. I just liked how spiky it was. And then here's uh, one of the really rare orchids. There's a lot of very rare orchids there. Um, there's a lot of people doing poaching of the orchids. So uh, whenever we put the orchids in, um, iNaturalist automatically obscures the location of all of the orchids so people can't just like go steal it. And so it, you uh, only show us the location to the nearest 10 miles or so. Here's an Enteloma called Enteloma dragonosporum. Um, there was a lot of Entelomas in Ecuador. It's one of the most common genera and one of the most mysterious genera. What do those ones taste like? This one didn't have much flavor. <laughs> uh, here's a Favalachia. And so Favalachia is really closely related to Mycena. And uh, I got these little pores under there, really tiny things. And then here's a moth. Uh, this moth is like emulating a fly or a wasp or something. Um, I just like this because it was like really metallic and iridescent. And here's a gecko. And you can see really cool pattern. And then this is uh, Gibbalula. Um, so this we found by flipping over a fern, and they really like humid areas. So like this fern was right next to a waterfall, and um, it's making the spores right here. So these spores fly off and it infect more spiders and kill the spiders. So that's the spider there. And here's a glass wing butterfly. Um, these things are really hard to photograph because they're like really flighty and they move really quick. Uh, but this one... Um, Turns out that it's a really rare glass winged butterfly and just endemic to this area. And here is Gloeocephala. 
And so it's a fungus that has these cool little hairs there, and it's very tiny. Um, this whole big log-looking thing is actually the stem of a leaf. Here's Gloeocephala lutea. So this cool, bright, yellow Gloeocephala. And then here's a glow-in-the-dark picture that I took at night. And um, it's these leaves. And so I don't know what kind of mushroom it was, uh, because there was no mushrooms, but there was this glowing mycelium. And so you can see it's like this rhizomorphic mycelium, probably mycena. And um, so I take the same picture at night and in the day, and you can see these cool glowing rhizomorphs. Uh, but a lot of these places, it's like you turn off the lights and you start walking, and there, there'll just be thousands of glowing leaves in your field of view. So it kind of looks like almost like the night sky or something like that. Um, it can be really cool. So that section wasn't covered by leaves? So it was no, it was just like that. Uh, the humidity was really high out there, and so like, yeah, it was just, the mycelium can just be out and doesn't dry out. And then um, we led a foray last year, and um, we did the foray at Finca Hymatlos, which is my friend's eco-resort. And one of the people that came along in our foray was a famous music producer. And it um, turns out that is someone that I've been listening to for a long time, a um, really cool guy named Nathan, and so he played a DJ set for our party. Mm. And that's the, the people that came along on our foray. And then here's a Guzmaniana. So um, it's kind of like a bromeliad, pineapple family. Uh, another really rare one. And then here's a bull eat. There's not too many bull eats there, but this is Gyrodon Manticula, which is mycorrhiza with alder. So there was a bunch of alder around there. And this thing is a daddy long leg type thing. Um, and it was being parasitized by, I believe they call this a bovaria. So these are the parathesia that makes the spores. And the spores are really long and thin. And you can actually see them here flying through the air. Wow. Yeah, so I found this at night and just um, had my friend held a really bright light. And it was able to capture that. And then the same daddy long legs in ultraviolet light looks like this. And so these things are big. They're like six inches across. And they're really scary looking, but they're harmless, and they're super fluorescent. Amazing. And this is what they look like in white light. You can see it, it looks like it wants to bite or something, but they just <laughs> don't. <laughs> and after we were done doing all this mushroom hunting in Ecuador, we went to the herbarium in Quito. And I talked to Rosa, and she's the curator of the herbarium there, and I asked her if we could leave our mushrooms that we were collecting in her herbarium. And she said that we could, as long as I came there and volunteered to help identify all the psilocybe in her herbarium. <laughs> so you can see this is, um, you know, they have like all the different genera here. And here's the psilocybe spot. And, they had, and then they have them all in the envelopes here. And so the envelopes have dried mushrooms. They save them forever. And so here's some of the psilocybe envelopes. Um, this one here is psilocybe subzapaticorum that was identified by Gaston Guzman who is the person who just described this species. And it's kind of cool because they got like coordinates and altitude and some description and um, they collected it in 2002. And so I went through all of these little packets and uh, mounted them in the microscope. There's Rosa there and we had this nice Nikon microscope and it was camera on top, connected it to the computer so we could take really nice photos of everything. So I was able to like write microscopic notes of all the different psilocybe and identify them. And there was a few that couldn't be identified. They're either obscure species or new species. Um, so that was really cool seeing all of that stuff there. Here is Andy Better. And Andy is super cool. Uh, he lives in Colorado, uh, but he's also from Ecuador. And he hooked us up with all of these science people. And the science people were really nice. Um, really cool people to hang out with, and they also had permits to collect, so we were able to do a bunch of collection under their permits, which was really cool. And uh, they were mostly like amphibian and frog experts, so they were able to identify all of our frogs and amphibians. Um, this one is another entoloma, and these entolomas are really cool because they're really fluorescent. And so this is uh, ultraviolet light, and I like this one. It just has like a really sharp umbo on it. And they're really easy to see at night, just like panning the ultraviolet light around the forest floor. They, you can see them from like 100 feet away. Alan, do you need a yellow filter to be able to see that? No. Um, 
The, uh, the light I use is a, call a 365 nanometer light, and it's far enough away from visible light that you, um, and it doesn't really get picked up by the sensor, but what it's doing is it hits these chemicals in the mushroom and it converts the ultraviolet light into visible light. So the mushrooms are emitting visible light, so it's just like a regular camera, even just a plain old cell phone would do it, um, and picks this up. And what it's really doing is it's kind of like a chemical sensor. Um, so you get like almost any color in the rainbow fluorescence from these mushrooms, and that tells you a little bit about the chemistry of the mushroom. Um, it's really hard to walk in a lot of places in Ecuador, so a lot of times we've got to go along the streams, and that, then we can not have to like go through the brush. And really cool flowers, this one's called Justicia. Um, and Justicia is a really common garden plant, not this species, but this genus is very common in gardens in California. And here's Jordan Jacobs photographing some Psilocybe zapaticorum. I think Jordan might be here at the fungus fair today. Um, really cool guy. He runs a psilocybin testing lab in Portland. Here's a leaf hopper. Uh, they can have really good colors. And this one is Lepiota erythrosticta. I really like the kind of snake skin pattern on the stem here. Um, and just like magenta colors in the cap. I was right in the middle of the trail. And then this one here is um, Luca Caprinus. And this is a species described from Brazil, Luca Caprinus bruneo luteus. Um, it's pretty big, like six inches tall. And you might see something similar in your plant pots here in San Diego, but this one has this kind of like brown disc in the middle. And the ones around here don't have that as much. There's a they grow in what? Um, that's like the, the dirt. Yeah, um, it's really hard to tell what kind of dirt is around because there's like so much vegetation and stuff. Uh, but almost all the mushrooms are growing sapotrophically on the decaying plant matter. So they don't really care that much about the dirt. They, carry, they care much more about the plants. That's another little leucocoprinus with a cricket. And here's an anole, and this anole had been sitting there, the same anole from like more than 24 hours. So his strategy is just to wait for prey to come along. Um, but very cool little thing, a miniature alligator. And there's lots of waterfalls there. And lots of different species of praying mantises. Um, so this one that I kind of like is it's like really thin and jet black. Here's the Trichilomopsis, another thing with the anastomos and gills. And sometimes you find thousands of these Trichilomopsis on a, um, on a stump. This here is Douglas Smith, so he's a gallerina expert from California. And uh, Manuel Mendoza is a copernoid expert. So like whenever I'm on iNaturalist or Facebook and somebody posts a copernoid and I don't know what it is, I always tag Manuel and he knows exactly what they are. Uh, but we had a microscope there so we could figure out uh, a lot of the unusual species of mushrooms. So this is the foray that I was leading. Uh, another thing that we saw a lot of was Psilocybe moseri. And Psilocybe moseri is really closely related to Psilocybe zapaticorum. So it's a really strong psilocybin mushroom. But moseri grows at lower elevations than zapaticorum. It's, um, it's you know, kind of <coughs> tropical areas. And it turns out that on this foray, the most common mushroom that we saw was Psilocybe moseri. Um, so it was kind of just all over the place. And um, the place that we were staying also had a permanent moth light. So it's like this whiteboard, and it just has um, these you know, permanent lights sort of set up, and then just, we just turn it around around sunset. And you can see hundreds of species of moths, like all in the same little area. This one I like because it kind of looks like a map, of, like a geographic map or something. And there's all different shapes and sizes and colors of moths. And so this one was cool because it has, it looks like a band of like solder or mercury almost, like liquid metal there. And there was a lot of them, they were green and kind of had these like gold fringes along the side of them. And that's what they look like when they're flying. They have the eyes to confuse predators. That reminds me of a banana. 
It's kind of a fire one. But yeah, just so many different colors. I like the iridescent blue ones. And this one has the, looks like 24 karat gold fringe along the side of it. That one also. And so I just took all these moth pictures, put them on iNaturalist, and all the moth experts were able to tell me what they were. And some of them were new species, but moths are much more studied than mushrooms. Yeah, this one's cool because it always has hearts on the back. So all those yeah. are just nighttime pollinators pretty much then, right? Um, I don't, well, some of them maybe, but nobody really knows why the moths are attracted to light. These are definitely moths that are active at night. I'm not sure if they're pollinating or not, but they were just like whatever got attracted to the lights at night. Were there a lot of white flowers out there? Some. Um, I saw a couple white flowers, uh, but not like a huge amount. This is kind of a cool moth because it looks like a falcon. And then this is the same moth just from the back. And here's some more mycenas. Um, this mycena has this disc at the base. Um, the one in, in San Diego that does that is called Mycena tenerima. Um, these have these little spines all over them. And then here's a bioluminescent Mycena. So this one, um, I picked up the stick and I started carrying it. And I carried it for like 10 minutes until I just like sat down to set up my camera again. And when I did, I noticed that it was glowing in the dark. And so this one had uh, stems that were glowing really bright, but the caps and mycelium was not glowing at all but probably a new species of Mycena. And here's a slime mold, some kind of physorum. And another cordyceps. Um, this one is Ophiocordyceps australis. So here's a big carpenter ant. And then the cordyceps itself, the fruiting body, it's making these really long spores. So you can see that some of the spores are coming right out of the pores there. And these things were really common. We would see like several cordyceps every day. You never really get tired of photographing cordyceps. This one here is Ophiocordyceps amazonica. Um, and it always grows on grasshoppers. Um, that's a parathesia there. Is the grasshopper dead first? Or? Yes. Well, I don't know if it's dead first. It's definitely dead by now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure if these things kill grasshoppers or if they just kind of like the spores land and then they just wait for the grasshopper to die and then take it over. But it wouldn't surprise me if it did kill grasshoppers. Um, these cordyceps are super picky about the host that they will parasitize. So like each species of cordyceps has just one species uh, of insect that it parasitizes. And like those ones that you always see that parasitize ants, there's like 700 species of cordyceps to go with 700 species of ants. Is there a study that to use cordyceps then when the locust swarms come out? So you would have to find a, a species of cordyceps that was for that species of locust. Um, so usually what they'll do is they'll use something less specific like metarhizium or bovaria. So those are also um, fungi that attack insects, but they're not nearly as picky as the cordyceps. So the dots here are parathesia. I'm sorry, I'm oh. Of, um, oh, like that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's the fungus or that's just how the, the, the mushroom was. Um, but kind of looks like fungi coming out all over it. So it could be a different fungi? Maybe. It's more like, uh, I think it's probably the other stage. So um, this would be the sexual stage where it makes spores that only have half of the genome. And then down here, the asexual stage and make, would make spores that have the whole genome. So they have several different strategies for spreading. And that helps it get like all the diversity that it needs, but also just be able to clone itself. I think that's what's going on there. There's another weevil with the Ophiocordyceps curculeanum. And we do a lot of night hunting there. So this is an orchid. And I just had all my friends hold these black lights. We can get pictures of the orchids in the black light. 
has turned it out to be a pretty rare orchid. And this is another kind of cool looking one. Uh, yeah, with the ultraviolet, it turns bright blue. So this is fluorescent. And they got some corals here. This is a Theoclavulina, probably Theoclavulina zippelii. And then this was probably the craziest thing that we found. Um, here on the right, this is a stinkhorn egg. And that is cool, but not necessarily crazy. But then it has this crazy parasite coming off of it. And there's a few stinkhorn eggs. And we watched these over a few days, and these things never hatched into stinkhorn. So the parasite kind of stopped it from fruiting. Uh, but I contacted Larissa in Brazil. And Larissa is an amazing mycologist, and she's the world expert on stinkhorns. And asked her about this, and she had never seen anything like this. Um, and then Larissa invited me to Brazil later on, and so I was able to go hunt mushrooms with her <laughs> as well. Um, there is the, the, the parasite coming out, so just crazy looking thing. Parasitic fungi? Yeah, so it's parasitizing the other fungus. And Justicia. And uh, a lot of these like very small oyster looking things. This was a Lentinellus. What does that taste like? Uh, it didn't have any flavor. And then here's a Pseudohydnum. Um, so they, we call these like cat's tongues. Um, these particular ones are new species of Pseudohydnum. Um, but I like to put lights behind them because they're really translucent. And then this thing here is a Pseudoscorpion. And this pseudoscorpion only grows in caves, and it's not only a new species, but also a new genus. Um, so my friend is studying these and publishing a paper on these pseudoscorpions. We're actually in the caves looking for this specific pseudoscorpion. Hmm. And then here's another psilocybe. Um, this one was growing right next to a waterfall. So if you see here, the gills start out cream-colored. So I didn't pick this, I just left it there and came back a week later, and it was still there a week later, but the gills had turned very dark purple because the spores are purple, so the gills change color to the spore color. And then another psilocybe that they have there is psilocybe cerulescens. Uh, this one is one of the landslide mushrooms, you can see it's staining blue pretty well. And so this grows in disturbed habitats, and this was just in the parking lot of where we were staying. So all of the disturbance from all the cars and everything to grow. There's one of the nice rivers. This was not easy to cross. And here's a scorpion. That's ultraviolet light. And then the same thing in just white light. So all of the scorpions light up like crazy in black light. And I kind of like how you can like see all of the uh, all the little hairs and stinger and everything is Really well defined. Lots of, lots of different genera of scorpions there. Here's Selegionella. That's some kind of a fern. And then this thing is actually not a cordyceps or anything. Um, this is a wax deposit. So this insect down here, it makes this crazy wax. And then when the predators come along, they like try to eat it, but they just bite into the wax and the insect escapes. <laughs> Here's a lichen called Coengenium. So this lichen just kind of like engulfs the stems of plants and it's photosynthesizing. There's a dehydrator that our friend made for us so we could dry the mushrooms. There's another trichelomopsis. Uh, here's one of the flowers. This uh, started with a U, it's like Ursulinus or something. Um, but yeah, definitely maybe moth pollinated. And then one of the things that I really had wanted to see was these, uh, orc um, this uh, deadly snake. So this is the green viper, and it hangs out up in trees. So you don't have to worry about stepping, them, stepping on them, but you don't want to like go running through the trees at night. They're nocturnal. Um, and you can see it's got the really big poison glands there and the cool slit in the eye. Um, so this thing is about four feet off the ground. Um, so this is Bothrops bilineatus, and it is uh, super venomous. Um, it's like the green version of the Fertilance. 
There's some Merasmius, the nice stem color. Um, this one here is Merasmialis cubensis. Um, so it was discovered in Cuba and it kind of has this cool vulva at the base of the stem. Um, so there's like 200 different mushrooms that have the species epithet cubensis, and they're all completely unrelated. So Psilocybe cubensis was discovered in Cuba, and Merasmielis cubensis was discovered in Cuba. So a lot of times they'll discover something in Cuba, and they'll just name it after Cuba, but they're totally unrelated. <laughs> Could have been the same guy, right? <laughs> Could look it up. Lots of Lysalaria. Another Psilocybe that we see is Psilocybe youngensis. So uh, Psilocybe youngensis was described from the youngest region of Bolivia. And this one's a wood lover, so it's always growing on well-decayed hardwood logs. And it has a really thin cap, so it's like almost translucent. And then another one that we saw is Psilocybe zapatocorum. And Psilocybe zapatocorum is kind of cool because it has these, um, this really kind of nice stem texture. And yeah, I really like the stem texture. And as you can see, it's staining blue really strongly. And so um, up until recently, it was thought that the strongest psilocybin mushroom in the world was Psilocybe azurescens, because that had up to 2% psilocybin. Uh, but I found some Psilocybe zapatocorum in Mexico and gave it to Jordan Jacobs, who tested it in his lab. And it came back with almost 3%. So it turns out that this is the strongest wild psilocybin mushroom that's known. These can also get really big, like this thing was like six inches tall, um, and they grow in landslides. Um, so on, on this particular day, we found thousands of these things. Um, so if you want to come to Ecuador, I'm leading a mushroom hunt in Ecuador March 26th through April 2nd. And so it's going to be at Finca Heimatlos, so it's that place um, that we were at for most of the time. I'm leading forays and doing all sorts of cool stuff there. Um, and last year for the foray that I led, we made an iNaturalist project. And so whenever people, we encouraged everyone to put iNaturalist on their phones and take pictures of everything. So we made like a thousand observations and found 432 species. And there were 19 of us there. And then you could kind of turn it into a game where it's like, the, <laughs> where like Douglas Smith, he found 146 different species. And um, you can see the, like, the most commonly observed species. So we found Psilocybe moseri 16 times, um, which was kind of funny because before this trip, it had only been found like five times in the whole history of iNaturalist. Um, and then you know, that Luca caprinus was really common, was, and then some of these tree frogs. And so um, if you want to know more about this trip, um, it's, there's information on, a, on my website, which is mycena.llc, and there's a, a page for the trip. So Mexico, I'll probably lead a foray in September, but I haven't planned it yet, so I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I, I usually like to go to southeastern Mexico, and very likely it'll be a foray there. Have you ever been to the Venezuelan Amazon? No, I've never been to Venezuela, but I would really like to. I think it's really unexplored there for sure. And I think that is all I have for you. But if you've got any questions, I'm ha happy to answer them. I have two. Uh, two questions, awesome. I heard you on a podcast and somebody was talking about your work in taxonomy. Yeah, I like taxonomy. Yeah. I don't know what a follow-up question to that would be. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, just like trying to figure out what all these things are is, is really interesting. Um, I just looked up the cordyceps from California and we got like, 356, so that's kind of a lot. Um, so there are actually are quite a few cordyceps things around. And there's some in Los Angeles. Oh yeah, there's, there's plenty in San Diego. That's kind of cool. Yeah.